Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010, Summer Session 2019. Here's our book, Introduction to World Philosophy, a multicultural reader. We are going over the empiricism of Wang Chong in this, in this video. So we're going over part three of the book, Epistemology, the study of knowledge. What is knowledge? How do you get knowledge? Can you get knowledge? Is there such a thing as knowledge? So Wang Chong is an empiricist. Uh, uh, so empiricists and rationalists, those are the two main schools when it comes to epistemology. Empiricists say you can only gain knowledge through sense impressions, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling. Knowledge comes into you from outside via your sense organs. That's empiricism. I can't see or smell or hear or touch or taste the soul or God. Therefore, that's not knowledge. Those are fictions. For most, for most empiricists, that's what they say. Um, Berkeley, we'll see, is slightly different. He does believe in God, yet he's an empiricist. He says, oh, what do you see? You actually see ideas. Everything is a conscious experience. A sight is an idea, a smell. But we'll get to that. For now, empiricism is taken in a... a more or less a materialist perspective by Wang Chong. So the question is, the two questions we'll be going over are part for exam two, questions for part A, number two, and for part B, number four. So question part A, number two, Wang Chong claims to be reasoning on Taoist principles. That's on page 329, that's a quote. Do you think Wang Chong's reasoning agrees with or contradicts Shuang Zi's reasoning on Taoist principles? Why? So this video, it'll help you to look at the previous video on Shuang Zi, which covered question part A number one for exam two. And that is, why does Shuang Zi call unity with the Tao obliterating? What does that have to do with this concept of putting oneself in subjective relation with externals? And why does he suggest we do that? So, Wang Chong, it seems to me, according to the introductory notes, he was trying to cleanse Confucianism and Taoism from superstitions that had been accumulating over the years. And he wanted to bring people back to the original Taoist principles. Though I don't see it that way, I see him as not really in tune with the original Taoist principles because he doesn't mention anywhere this obliterating unity with the Tao and putting oneself in, in subjective relation with externals. He, he attacks those kinds of ideas. You might read it differently. When I grade, all I'm really grading on is knowledge of the text. If you have an opinion that's totally opposite of mine, but you support it with appropriate quotes and it seems valid, you know, I might not, I still might not agree, but if you make a good argument and I can tell you study the text, and gave it some deep thought, then it's still gonna, you're still gonna get a good grade. Uh, and with questions like these, it's not always so easy to say it is one way or the other. But I think when you get a taste of Wang Chung's empiricism and we contrast it with Shuang Zi, he's diverging from the most fundamental point that Shuang Zi was making about this unity with the Tao. And instead he focuses on we can only gain knowledge of this purposeless material world through our sense perceptions. There's no ghosts, there's no souls, there's no meaning in the world. That seems more like just materialism and atheism than Taoism, which does believe in this kind of all-pervasive organizing principle, the Tao. So let me read a little bit on page 328 from the introductory notes. And it says here on page, all right, so Wong Chung, uh, 27 to 97 Common Era, uh, is it, it articulated the central doctrine of empiricism in the next paragraph. Uh, by Wong Chong's time during the Han Dynasty, both Confucianism and Taoism had accumulated a thick layer of superstition. Confucianism was China's leading philosophical school rapidly developing into a religion and attracting a set of superstitions. Taoism was becoming a mystical religion with an elaborate set of rituals. Confucius and Lao Tzu were worshipped as gods. People believed in divination and destiny. 
They thought gods routinely interfered in human affairs to reward the good, punish the bad, and enforce a variety of seemingly pointless rules. People arranged their houses and lived according to the principles of Feng Shui. So, Wang Chung is saying that's all superstitious nonsense. And natural events have no religious meaning. There's no meaning in the universe anywhere. And for him, that seemingly cleansing Taoism of its superstitious principles. Well, it might effectively cleanse it of superstitious principles, but it also cleanses it of the ultimate Taoist principle of the subjective relation with externals. We are one with everything. If we are one with everything and we have a sense of purpose, then everything would seem to also have some kind of a sense of purpose, some kind of a harmonizing influence, although we might not be able to describe that with words, we might realistically be skeptical about the human being's ability to express this knowledge symbolically through words. The fact that there is this mystical union to be had seems to be disregarded by Wang Chung. So let me just read a little bit of uh, some selections from his writing here on page 329. So that his writing is broken down into subtitled sections. And the first one is spontaneous action. Why must we assume that the heavens act spontaneously? And he says, because they have neither mouth nor eyes. Intentional activity is associated with a mouth and with eyes. The mouth wishes to eat and the eyes to see. These desires manifested outside come from inside. When the mouth and the eyes are craving for something considered advantageous, it is due to those desires. Now, when the mouth and the eyes are not activated by desire, there is nothing for them to seek. Why should there be activity then? All right. The universe is not, uh, does not have any intention. It doesn't act with a purpose. Because if it did, it would have sense organs, which are the the gateways for desire. And the only reason anything acts is to fulfill a desire. So the universe doesn't have sense organs, therefore it can't have desires. If it doesn't have desires, it has no reason to act. So if it does act, it's doing so spontaneously with no purpose. That uh, essentially answers part B, question four for exam two. Why does Wang Chung point out that the heavens have no mouth or eyes? He's trying to show that there's no meaning in the universe. The universe doesn't act with any intention, with any intention to enforce laws of karma, to punish us for our sins or to reward us for our good deeds or to give us encouraging messages. There's no divinations that are possible. There's no kind of meaningful coincidences as we'll see he addresses that issue. That's why he says, he points out that the heavens have no mouth or eyes. So continuing here, um, he says, the changes in the heaven are similar to those of man. All right, so he's responding. People say, oh, how can you say that the heavens act without any meaning? Someone might argue, here's, he's going to reject what, what he's about to say. Someone might argue that every movement originates from inaction. There is desire provoking movement. And as soon as there is motion, there is action. The changes in the heaven are similar to those of man. How could they be spontaneous without intention or purpose? I reply that when the heavens move, they bring forth matter and energy. The mass of the heavens move, matter and energy come forth, and things are produced. When the heavens are changing, they do not desire to produce things thereby. Things are produced of their own accord. That is spontaneity. Releasing matter and energy, the heavens do not desire to create things, but things are created of themselves that is spontaneous action without intention or desire. So this is what I think his strategy is. Adopting this materialist perspective of a meaningless mechanical universe that has no intentional purposes. He's equating that with the Taoist idea of spontaneous action without intention or desire. But that kind of spontaneous Taoist action isn't the mechanical actions of matter and energy that Wang Chung is describing, it's the spontaneous action that emerges after somebody has realized the obliterating unity of the Tao. Once you know you're one with everything, then you just act without being aware of your difference between other things. And that kind of action is in tune with the Tao and it's 
none different from inaction because all these dualities are obliterated. So a Taoist spontaneous action without intention or desire in my reading is a lot different than this kind of mechanical, atheistic, soulless universe idea of the universe acts spontaneously without intention or desire. And yet you could say, you know, so in one respect, yeah, he's in tune with the Taoist idea of spontaneous action without intention or desire, but he's approaching it from a completely undaoist focus on objective material things that are different from other objective material things. So I'll just continue to read and then I'll compare Wang Chung to a couple of passages from Zi. although I went into those in detail in the previous video, which you should probably watch if you're going to answer question A, part uh, number two about Wang Chung. So just continuing here, he says, by the fusion of the matter and energy of the heaven and earth, all things of the world are produced spontaneously. The next paragraph, this is 329, the right-hand column. He says, reasoning on Taoist principles, we find that nature imbues all things with matter and energy. Among the many things of this world, grain dispels hunger. So things just happen of their own accord. Um, the heavens do not produce grain, silk, and hemp purposely in order to feed and clothe mankind. Just as by calamitous changes, they do not intend to reprove man. Things are produced spontaneously, and man wears and eats them. Um, so he says, if it wasn't that way, if the universe did have an intention, then where would be spontaneous action without aim and purpose? So you see, this is his the essence of his argument, which I think is his crucial flaw. Just because, you know, he's not understanding spontaneous action without aim or purpose in a, in a kind of a transcendental way. He's understanding it in a very mechanical matter and energy kind of a way. And that it's the same, the spontaneous action without aim or purpose coming from the Tao is this eternal force that harmonizes all opposites. Whereas his spontaneous action without aim or purpose is just a mechanical force that doesn't harmonize anything. And it's, it leads to this kind of a soulless universe idea, which to me is the opposite of the Taoist idea of the universe. Um, and I will go back to the Taoist idea of the universe from Shuangzi in a second, but I'm going to just go through a little bit more of, of uh, Wang Chung's philosophy here. On the left-hand column, the bottom of 330. This is, he's talking about the indifference of heavens. The heavens are not punishing you, they're not rewarding you. This is his philosophy. If the heavens had produced creatures on purpose, they ought to have taught them to love each other and not to prey upon and destroy one another. One might object that such is the nature of the five elements, that when the heavens created all things, they are imbued with the matter and energies of the five elements, and that these five together, uh, that these fight together and destroy one another. But then the heavens ought to have filled creatures with the matter and energy of one element alone, and taught them mutual love, not permitting the forces of the five elements to resort to strife and mutual destruction. So he's saying, if the heavens had a consciousness and an intention and a purpose, they ought to have created creatures to love each other, not to prey upon each other. Okay, well, the objection is, you know, the heavens, the the spiritual forces who created the universe created five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. That's all these ancient philosophies had this idea of these concentric spheres of elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether. We saw in the Upanishads and in the Phaedrus how that outermost ether sphere is the realm of eternal knowledge, the absolute forms of knowledge, which is the essence of our soul. The soul merges there in between reincarnations, according to the Hindus and Plato. So, okay, the five elements have their natures and they, they fight, water fights fire. And, and so however they intermingle with each other, that's the strife that creates all of the, the plethora of material objects. So uh, Wang Chung responds, oh, so there's an intentional agent behind the creation of the five elements well, then the heavens ought to have filled creatures with the matter and energy of one element alone and taught them mutual love. Well, that is what the uh, Taoist philosopher Zi says, this the unity of the Tao. 
specifically in the heavens. If you look at the bottom of page 326 at the right-hand column over to 327, he says, The perfect man, answered Wang Yi, is a spiritual being. Were the ocean itself scorched up, he would not feel hot. If the Milky Way frozen hard, uh, he would not feel cold. If the whole world trembled and the oceans boiled, he wouldn't be disturbed at all. In such case, he would mount upon the clouds of heaven, and driving the sun and the moon before him would pass beyond the limits of this external world, where death and life have no more victory over man. So then a little later he says, How does the sage seat himself by the sun and moon and hold the universe in his grasp? He blends everything into one harmonious whole, rejecting the confusion of this and that. Rank and precedence, which the vulgar prize, the sage stolidly ignores, the revolutions of 10,000 years leave his unity unscathed. The universe itself may pass away, but he will flourish still. So that is, um, that's the kind of unity, that's the spiritual philosophy. Realizing you're one with everything in the universe, specifically at the outermost boundary of heaven. So maybe the inner spheres of heaven have no purpose in our in mechanical and unthinking mass and energy but just outside that at the boundary of the external that is where shuang zi says we find the influence of the Tao. and i will read a little bit now on page 324 from shuang zi the very bottom of the right hand column he says um so he takes his refuge in Tao. All right, when being the case, the true sage rejects all distinctions of this and that. He takes his refuge in Tao and places himself in subjective relation with all things. In the right-hand column, I mean, left-hand column of page 325, when subjective and objective are both without their correlates, that is the very axis of Tao, and when that axis passes through the center at which all infinities converge, Positive and negative alike blend into an infinite one. Hence, it has been said that there's nothing like the light of nature. At the bottom paragraph of page 325 on the left, he says, Only the truly intelligent understand this principle of the identity of all things. They do not view things as apprehended by themselves subjectively, but transfer themselves into the position of the things viewed. And viewing them thus, they are able to comprehend them, nay, to master them. And he who can master them is near. So it is that to place oneself in subjective relation with externals, without consciousness of their objectivity, this is Tao. So, you're able to master them by transferring yourself into other things subjectively. Now, that's what Chuang Zi says. If we go back to Wang Chung... He rejects that kind of a possibility. He talks, for example, about on page 332, the right-hand column, the bottom paragraph. He says, We learn from historical books that the wife of Qi Liang turned towards the city wall, which collapsed in consequence. This implies that when Qi Liang did not come back from a military expedition, his wife cried out in despair in the direction of the city wall. So heartfelt were her sorrow and her laments that her feelings affected the wall, which tumbled down in consequence. So he rejects that. He's like, how could that be? The city wall is made of earth. The earth is devoid of a heart and intestines. So how could her emotions affect something made of earth? Two different elements. Where's the contact point for her sentiments to affect the physical thing? That's what he says. Well, Shuang Zi just talked about Overcoming all of the differences by transferring yourself into the position of the things viewed, and then you can understand them and master them. So that seems to leave open the possibility for a Taoist master who might understand and truly perceive the unity of the Tao, the obliterating unity of the Tao in which all distinctions are dissolved into this single essential perspective of everything simultaneously from a subjective perspective, it might be possible to influence seemingly external objects because you are contacting some underlying unity of them. That seems like a mystical, miraculous kind of a thing to say, and yet in light of 20th century physics, it's not 
impossible. There, there is this unity of things, according to string theory, which I've been talking about, everything is united at the outermost horizon of the cosmos, just like Zi was talking about, and Plato and the Phaedrus and the Upanishads and the ether, what they talked about. Um, <clears throat> that that's where the unity of everything is found. So it's not completely out of the realm of reason and science to say that we are somehow united with everything else. But Wang Chung says that it is, that that's just ridiculous. Um, but you know what, as I was going over there, I, the, um, I want to just reaffirm on page 330, the left-hand column at the bottom, Wang Chung says that, uh, you know, oh, so the heavens created five elements and that's how you account for strife, but then the heavens auto-filled creatures with the matter and energy of one element alone and taught them mutual love. Okay, so again, that's what the Hindus called ether. That's the uniting element in which Brahman exists, the city of Brahman. That's where Phaedra, uh, Plato says all of the absolute ideas are merged and control the material universe out at that outermost horizon of the universe. And Zi says the same thing. That's where we find mutual love. The one element is the Tao. The Tao is identified, according to Zi with the central most axis point of the universe where all infinities converge. That's page 325 on the left-hand column near the top. And it's also, the Tao is also united uh, where the perfect man mounts upon the clouds of heaven and driving the sun and moon before him passes beyond the limit of the external world. That's where you can find the unity of the Tao and overcome divisions and the animosities that come from these constant pairs of opposites by putting yourself in subjective relation with the external. And the ability to do that seems to be dismissed by Wang Chung in the name of cleansing Taoism of its superstitions. In my perspective, if I was writing this essay, I'd say he also cleansed Taoism of the Tao. So it seems to me. I'll read a little bit more here though, because he does talk about souls and, um, and that's kind of a, there's some similarity with Zi. So on page 331, he talks about ghosts. He says, the dead do not become ghosts, have no consciousness, and cannot injure others. How do we know this? We know it from other beings. Man is a being, and other creatures are likewise beings. When a creature dies, it does not become a ghost. So your dog dies, you don't see a dog ghost walking around, and these stories of people's ghosts is not true. Then he goes on to say on the right-hand column, man lives by virtue of his vital force. When he dies, this vital force is exhausted. It resides in the arteries. At death, the pulse stops and the vital force ceases to work. Then the body decays and turns into earth and clay. By what could it become a ghost? Without ears or eyes, men have no perceptions. In this respect, the deaf and the blind resemble... All right, so a little lower down, he says, man's vital force resides in the body as the millet and rice do in the bag and the sack. At death, the body decays and the vital force disperses just as the millet and the rice escape from the pierced or damaged bag or sack. So the vital force disperses. So he doesn't say the vital force decays like the body does. It disperses. So here is some possible link, saving link, for Wong Chung and Taoism, because this vital force disperses. Well, then there's some vital force throughout the universe. Is that what you're saying? Well, that would seem to be some kind of a medium for these kinds of interactions between subjective emotions and physical things, which he denied at, at the very end of this article. And it would seem to, in, if this vital force is in us and it permeates the universe, wouldn't that perhaps give the possibility of some kind of purposefulness of the universe? Not necessarily. If we continue on, after he talks about ghosts, he talks about the dead. He says, since the dead, this is page 332 on the left. He says, since the dead cannot become ghosts, they cannot have any consciousness either. We infer this from the fact that before their birth, men have no consciousness. Before they are born, they form part of the primogenial force. And when they die, they revert to it. This primogenial force is vague and diffuse, and the human spirit a part of it. Anterior to his birth, man is devoid of consciousness, and at his death he returns to this original state of unconsciousness. For how could he be conscious? 
All right, so he believes in some kind of a primogenial force, some kind of a vital force that disperses, but it's vague and diffuse, and it has no purposes in mind. Um, consciousness is the combination of that vital force and a material body. On the left-hand column, continuing on page 332, he says, There is no fire in the world burning quite of itself. How could there be an essence without a body, but conscious of itself? So once the vital force is separate from the body, it's not conscious anymore. They have to be combined, but bodies are perishable. They die. So there's no eternal form of consciousness. And he already said the universe isn't a body like a, like a human. It doesn't have eyes or a mouth. So it doesn't have consciousness. So this is his philosophy. It's, it is a more or less a materialist philosophy. He has this idea of a primogenial force, which seems to be something that doesn't decay, yet it has no purpose or consciousness. So in some sense, it's a little bit like Buddhism, um, but he doesn't believe in reincarnation. And so that separates him from Buddhism. So, uh, and it, I think it is important that even though we saw Shuang Zi say on page 324 that it seems the body has a soul, but we can't be sure. Um, most likely there is a soul, but he says on the left-hand column, but whether or not we ascertain what are the functions of the soul, it matters but little to the soul itself. For coming into existence with this mortal coil of mind, with the exhaustion of this mortal coil, its mandate will be exhausted. So that seems similar to what Wang Chung was saying. This, the vital force leaves when the body dies. Xuanzi says, what advantage is there in what men call not dying? The body decomposes and the mind goes with it. This is our real cause for sorrow. All right, so he's saying that the mind disperses after the body dies. However... It seems to be contradicted when he talks about placing your, taking refuge in the Tao and placing yourself in subjective relation with all things because the person who does that unites with that center at which all infinities converge and also mounts upon the clouds of heaven and passes beyond the limits of this external world where death and life have no more victory over him. Uh, have no more victory over man. So you can overcome death if you rise up to the outermost sphere of the horizon. That's the ether. That is the one element in which all things find love for each other that Wang Chung said the universe should have created if it had any kind of purposeful intentions in mind. On page 330 at the bottom of the left-hand column, we saw that. He says, but when the heavens ought to have filled creatures with the matter and energy of one element alone and taught the mutual love, not permitting the forces of the five elements to resort to strife and mutual destruction. That is what the sage, the perfect man, realizes that one element in which all other elements are combined and in which all differences are obliterated by the unity of the Tao, that is that outermost sphere and the centralmost point of the universe, both of which Wang Chung rejects or doesn't talk about and therefore to finish this video by going back over the questions here um, number uh, four for part b why does Wang Chung point out that the heavens have no mouth or eyes he says that on page 329 because he's saying the heavens have no purpose behind their actions purposeful action requires desires a, a desire to achieve some sense object if you see something you want or you want to taste something that gives you a motivation to act without those desires there's no, no motive to act the heavens have no mouth or eyes therefore they have no desires therefore they have no motivation to act with any purpose they just act spontaneously by creating matter and energy that's why he points out that the heavens have no mouth or eyes and in part a Question two, this is for exam two, Wang Chung claims to be reasoning on Taoist principles. Do you think Wang Chung's reasoning agrees with or contradicts Shuang Zi's reasoning on Taoist principles? Why? So I've been arguing that for the most part, he contradicts Shuang Zi's reasoning because he doesn't, Wang Chung does not base his reasoning on this idea 
of putting yourself in a subjective relation with externals by realizing the obliterating unity of the Tao, specifically in the central most point where all infinities converge, and the outermost heaven where you can transcend birth and death. That's why I would explain it. If you see that he does um, agree with Zhuangzi's reasoning, then just explain to me why. And as long as you're supporting your answers with pertinent quotes from the text, and I can tell that you've read both and have thought about it, you know, feel safe to experiment a little bit. Just prove to me that you've read the text deeply. That's ultimately what I'm looking for. Okay, so that will be it for the empiricism of Wang Chung.